about uh, what you might call an anti-pattern, which shows itself in so much interesting pownage and so much ubiquitous pownage that surrounds us on the internet. We started applying basic language theoretic principles to analyzing vulnerability uh, as of, uh, depending on how you count, two years ago or a year ago when uh, Len Sessman and Meredith Patterson presented their uh, bag of attacks on X509 uh, that uh, started it off. I was looking at the practice of exploitation as a practice of programming of uh, machines that are inherent in targets and are in fact automata that you encounter in language theory all the time. And this came together. We gave a talk at uh, CCC last year. It is uh, on our website. Uh, we recommend it to you as uh, an introduction. Today, we want to follow up with our practical examples of all the vulnerabilities that express themselves and may actually come from the linguistic effects in data, from the effects in data formats that have a non-trivial complexity in the language theoretic sense. And of course, uh, this is an early effort. This is our beagle. We are going to sail to strange lands and collect specimen of strange species. And we hope to build enough of a collection to start a cladistic classification of insecurity. When you see so many examples of how things go wrong, a generalization should follow. Only so can you understand the common origins of all these species and the uh, internal connections between them. So these are the early dispatches from the Beagle. Right, so during our 28C3 talk, we introduced the term shotgun parser. Um, we pointed out that interspersing the recognition of data with the processing of data leads to the actual parsing logic being scattered throughout the code and therefore from a refactoring standpoint comparatively, comparatively often rather difficult to isolate into code which provides a proper separation of concern between recognition and processing. And very shortly we'll be looking at some very practical examples of what happens when that boundary gets confused. Um, we're going to be talking about it as a syntax versus semantics boundary. So recognition has to do with syntax. Proce the processing of that data, once it's, once it's been correctly validated, is a matter of semantics. And when the two begin to blend, this is where unexpected results start to come out. So, in these early dispatches, we bring you uh, old stuff, old but uh, incredibly famous, as you will see. And the rationale for this is uh, when you look at software that's just uh, written slap dash and not particularly trusted by anyone, uh, analyzing it is not interesting. You want to look at the errors of experts, not uh, devices. Furthermore, you want to look for bugs that took uh, years, uh, in some case, uh, a decade, uh, to find an exploit. Because, again, the intuition of uh, an attacker is something that is extremely valuable and we're convinced extremely close to theory. The question of what computers can and cannot compute has been discussed at the very theoretical end of uh, CS from uh, uh, Church and Turing. On the other hand, the hacker community has been exploring it with respect to each pwned platform, uh, going beyond the models and finding the actual limits of computation on day-to-day uh, -day systems. So we're going to look at those uh, samples, and in each and every case, 
we will show that something about the data format complexity, something about the input language, may have been what was the undoing of the trustworthiness of the security of that code. Uh, bugs, or other cogs of weird machines programmed by those exploits, were there, not for some random reason, but for the reason of a particular feature of a data language uh, that the uh, programs were supposed to uh, recognize safely before acting on it. And so, here is a, um, a recap, a very brief recap, of our length set way of approaching uh, the analysis of a piece of software. You've got input. And then your program separates into uh, parts, roughly. The recognizer, where you're checking input or validating input, or whatever you'd like to call it. And this is where you're expected to be paranoid. This is where you're expected to uh, check all possible uh, conditions that may slip through. And then at some point you have to actually do the work. And this is the processor. Uh, and they are separated by this uh, boundary, which is tenuous. People don't uh, usually think about it too much. But uh, when they do and uh, want to prove things about it, they call it the contract or the specification. Or mostly it's just the expectations. There is the beak that goes at the food and is hopefully right for the food. And then there is the guts that uh, take care of uh, processing the data. And you really uh, you know, expect that the data uh, is uh, crushed up uh, in the same little chunks when it reaches the gut. And bear in mind what we're saying here, uh, what, what, we're, what we're referring to when we say a recognizer here really is the input handler. If you write your input handler to just accept you know, a raw buffer, maybe that's okay for the contract that you have with the processing part of your code. If it's not, you know, then we've got our fruit-eating finch chowing down everything from insects to sticks to depleted uranium, and what ends up going on in its guts is not going to be happy when it comes out. Not at all. This is the rumbling of the weird machine, and uh, it is otherwise known as pillage. Your expectations are not satisfied, your code exposes uh, a write or a read or a memory corruption or an integer overflow, and uh, moreover, they chain up because this is what the digestive system does, it chains things up. This is what processing logic does, it chains things up. And you chain up an arbitrary computation that you never really expected to perform. So you have to bring the right beak to the fight, uh, to the food, sorry. <laughs> or you have to bring the right weapon to the fight and the right beat to the food. Uh, the recognizer is that weapon. This is the thing that is responsible for your system security. This is what will allow you to crash up uh, the input properly or to safely reject what you shouldn't be introducing into your system. And by the way, the tool using Finch is real. Uh, it was one of the uh, Darwin's uh, finds on the beagle. So, we are going to talk about two cases of a recognizer not being up to its job. And then we are going to switch to uh, uh, the hairiness of C and uh, the buffer overflows uh, and uh, shellcode and stuff like that. The two examples we are going to talk about are the array common bond. And then the uh, most epic fail of uh, 2010, which got the pony for that, the anti cross site scripting in uh, Internet Explorer 8. And we'll see that in each one of these cases, uh, a wrong weapon was brought to the fight, the wrong beak was right. The recognizer is a recognizer, is a recognizer. If somebody is telling you that you can uh, do away with fully understanding your input, fully checking it up to your specification, instead uh, you could just perform sanitization, well, this is a myth. We're not going to dwell on the magic codes of PHP, but this is example. Um, this is the fundamental example 
of uh, there having to be a property uh, of the language that you're enforcing. You can't merely just uh, suppress, uh, substitute out bad stuff. Your expectation is a language property. It should be treated as such. Now, I want to draw a quick distinction here between trying to suppress quote unquote bad stuff and trying to enforce a strict separation between code and data. Um, Dan Kaminsky's uh, 2000, I can't remember if it was 9 or 10, but his project Interpolique, um, which was kind of a poor man's monad approach to marking data as tainted in, um, in uh, PHP string interpolation. Um, in order to submit SQL queries more safely, so that you could t so that you could tell, okay, this bit of uh, you know, this is this chunk of data that we wrapped up here is the user input, and so we're just going to carefully wrap it up in a little box that can't be opened until it actually gets to the receiver, which then can ensure that it hasn't been tampered with. And interpolate didn't quite go that far, but it was on it was well on the way towards that. My point being. The monadic approach is not an attempt to suppress, it is merely an attempt to flag. You're not transforming and then untransforming, or transforming and then further transforming, um, you're just indicating it as such. And it was a transform, untransform that caused the Reddit comment bomb, as we'll see in just a moment. Um, but yeah, so this comes down to safety and liveness properties. Um, a safety property is you are, you are guaranteed that X thing will happen. A likeness property is you are guaranteed that X bad thing will not happen. Um, so in this case, um, there's the likeness property of you know data has not been tampered with, and we'll see that this actually does not hold for Reddit for yeah. didn't in 2009. And if you really believe in input sanitization, uh, it's not the vehicle, it's the laws boat that's going to be free. And it's not going to be free. So, a pervasive thing is that escaping is just string replacement. You throw in a regex method, uh, you're done. Proper escaping is, uh, in reality, a language property. You should write an automaton uh, to express it, to accept it. Uh, you should uh, make sure that this automaton recognizes uh, that language. This is what Reddit did. They wanted to prevent the double escaping. So when they escaped the character, they replaced it with an MD5 of that character, dropping down those rather large chunks in. And then at the uh, end of uh, the substitution, transformation, computation, uh, they replaced them back into uh, the uh, original uh, form. And of course, the moment this occurs to you, you think, hmm, what if I put the MD5 in the input from the beginning, from the start? So maybe the uh, escape the substitution system will substitute it in the end. So uh, when you are handling that, that, that string of characters, uh, you are already dealing with uh, a language accepting automaton. You are dealing with uh, uh, a rewriting system. And, uh, you know, what comes in comes out. You uh, can drive computation that way. This is also what gives them the lilies about um, rewriting rules for things like JavaScript. You know, Kaha is a pretty cool project, and it's doing some neat stuff with object capability security, but the rewriting of the UV does give me the willies. And what completed this circle and built uh, a <coughs> scriptable common bond was another markdown feature uh, that allowed the user to define variables uh, to get substituted. And so these two things feeding into each other uh, allowed you to escape your JavaScript with uh, 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 your pre-supplied MD5, which was helpfully uh, converted to your um, 
original that you wanted to uh, perform. And then on mouse over, it would cycle over and over and over again. And you would automatically post comments on Reddit. Uh, when you complete the circle, you usually need a loop and an if. And uh, then you have something that uh, uh, is pretty much your standard uh, Turing machine, your standard program. Uh, Labels are branching initials, that's all yeah. it takes. But it gets better. Oh my god, it gets so much better. The I, uh, e, uh, anti XSS feature followed the no script approach, except um, Microsoft thought. So we're seeing this request going out to a server. Let us match things in that request and let us rewrite the response of the uh, server with regexps as it comes back from the server if it looks like it's trying to do cross-site scripting. So we're going to watch the input, uh, generate some patterns for the output, and correct the output, break the output of uh, the uh, remote server with uh, regex like this. Uh, the letters in uh, braces were replaced with a hash mark, presumably breaking uh, the HTML object. Now, HTML uh, and generally the structure of web pages is at least context-free. It's recursively nested. You bring a regex to validate something or to operate on something that is recursively nested. What do you get? Um, pretty much. This is this is Dejector from 2005. You know, you need to be using context-free validation in order to validate a context-free language, and if you instead decide to try to whitelist with regular expressions, the pigeonhole principle is going to end up biting you and you end up getting exploited. It's just in HTML rather than in, in SQL. Uh, regex are good for things that nest to a finite depth. You uh, go one level deeper, there's absolutely no telling what you're going to rewrite. Now, since this is coming from the remote server, and is affected by the outgoing uh, uh, request to it, you can manipulate this rewriting system every which way, rendering perfectly safe sites vulnerable with your anti-XSS protection. And who saves you? Believe it or not, Google actually switched off IEA XSS protection in the Chrome extension for Google Docs. So you can actually avoid this problem in Chrome, or, or sorry, wait. Why oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, that, no, that's right, yeah. yeah they shut yeah, yeah, up Google, actually. Yeah, it's nothing to do with Chrome extension, my bad. Yeah. But yeah, no, they, just, they, they shut that bit off, and suddenly, you know, so, suddenly you can't get pwned by this anymore. Uh, because basically Google tells you, hey, this XSS protection thing, don't do it. That extra computational engine that actually rewrites your page on the fly in ways that your the server cannot appreciate, um, just don't do it. Uh, and, and it was uh, the worst fail of um, uh, a defensive measure in 2010 uh, as uh, awarded the penalty. Uh, this is very important. You bring the wrong kind of uh, computational engine to the recognition task, to the data validation task, it will become a part of the exploit mechanism. It will be borrowed uh, to actually make uh, your uh, actual application law. This is a general pattern. Now, if you haven't seen the Mario Hydra's uh, Got Your Nose talk, this is how uh, no JavaScript just the cascading style sheets and uh, HTML5 SCG tags can have a party in your browser. This is how your passwords, helpfully filled in by the password manager, into a rendered uh, element uh, with CCS every time, 
can brute force your password and send it out uh, to uh, you know a remote site. Again, if something brings the loop, yeah, this is this is this is shades of the proof that HTML5 and CSS together without JavaScript are Turing complete. I mean, the, the, the exploit that does this doesn't actually have to be Turing complete. It's sufficient for it to be a linear bounded automaton because it's doing a fairly simple task. Um, but yeah, if, if, if this doesn't frighten you, um, you don't need to be in web application security. If something brings repeated substitution, and the substitution can distinguish between uh, two alternatives, uh, chances are you have at least uh, a brain fog at all. Yeah, because if you, can, if you can provide input to some loop, if you can control that input, then if recognition and processing are interleaved, then you can drive the operation of that loop with a, with a specially crafted input. So this is to say, a recognizer, a rewriting system, is already there. Your data is already being transformed <coughs> as it is being consumed. A computation happens before you even start, uh, before you even start main. It happens before you have fully loaded your program. In another talk uh, of ours, uh, with a uh, student of mine, we look at uh, relocation and loading of health binaries and show that even before any binary code is jumped to, there is already a Turing complete environment that is driven by nothing other than the relocation entries that enable you to do ASLR and shift pieces of code back and forth uh, and uh, a dynamic simple table. This was the brain fucking elf metadata, metadata talk from this year's DEF CON with Surya and Bex. So, there is already a rewriting system. You just, you have to control it. You have to match it in what you do. You have to be certain about you know, what input is valid and what input is not valid. You have to recognize the good input and reject the bad input and only process what you can control. So now we're going to take a look at several binary specimens of finches that dropped root shell. Um, one in bind, one in OpenSSH, and one in OpenBSC. Um, and we're going to talk about software engineering principles that could have helped, that could have helped catch earlier on what was, uh, you know, what later turned out to be a root shell level vulnerability. Um, you know, these are these are best practices in the industry that, to be fair, are not as formal as we would like. Um, you know, we're going to we're, we're going to be you know getting into um, you know like the Bertrand Meyer, Kent Beck, you know level of like really classic software engineering recommendations. Um, but this is all stuff that you know th this is all this is all going to be about patterns that you can recognize in your own code as signs that you need to that, that you need to look into refactoring out a separation of concern between recognition and processing, between syntax and semantics. Because, you know, we've scared you enough with thou shalt have a proper recognizer. But, uh, you know, let's look at those classic pieces of software that um, have been serving the community quite well. Actually, I have to go back uh, one slide. You know, Bind, despite its um, reputation for bugs, it's the glue of the internet. Open SSH, no. a GCP IP step of the most uh, security aware uh, Unix distribution, or one that uh, certainly uh, strives to be such. And we're looking at pre authentication bug in uh, uh, that, and a remote code execution in the other. Isn't this something? I mean, if you can't trust this, what can you trust? If these people, if you can't trust these people, who can you trust? We hope to convince you that what caused these bugs to happen was that people have made uh, 
not for you easy, but just a little bit more relaxed with the data format, or a little bit more complex with uh, the data language. And to be honest, there are places in the code where they admit it themselves, you're about to see one. One concept that is central to all this is going to be context sensitivity. When you're looking at a piece of data, when you're writing your small functions to process a piece of data past the recognition stage, you want to make sure that you can validate this piece of uh, data on its own, or that you have the right context to see if it actually makes sense. This snowballs. The more context you need, the more context the language structure of this uh, input, say, offsets, back references, compression, uh, length fields, the more of this you have, the harder it is for you to validate uh, context sensitive data. So, the year is 1999, the Beagle uh, is uh, traveling in the past, and uh, it turns out back then that in DNS, it would be nice to be able to say, hmm, this name doesn't exist, but it would exist between these two names which do. And this could be a sign assertion, signing an NX domain, one bit response, no, I don't know this name, is silly. Assigning uh, this record that says, oh, this name would fall between these two, uh, which are defined, but it is itself not. That is signable. You can sign such a record. And indeed, there was a, a new type of record introduced into DNS called NXT, given by these two RFCs and, uh, RFCs and included in mind. And uh, it worked something like that. You could uh, uh, ask the name server uh, to retrieve it if you exploited a, an authoritative name server you could have your target name server retrieve uh, that record and get code and uh, the implementation of that NXT record was button so uh, that was T66 uh, by uh, the EDM crew was uh, the exploit. So uh, you could go about uh, exploiting name servers on the net if you control one authoritative one that you could bounce queries off of. And before we go into the code and look at it, and look at the uh, pattern of parsing that made this possible, keep in mind that DNS is context sensitive, and DNS format involves a length of fields. So, this is your typical DNS packet. Uh, there is a standard header, you know, query ID, flags, uh, and then uh, counts of various RRs, resource records. So there are four RRs here. What RRs do for names, for substrings, is they refer to previous RRs by a uh, offset negative offset back in the packet. Having spelled linux.unixwiz once, you don't want to spell it again. You just, in the RR, put uh, a back reference to that string in the packet. Now I want to point out from a parsing perspective, um, if you looked at Hammer, which is the um, packrat parsing library in C that uh, TQ and I uh, wrote earlier this year and are still working on, um, one of the things you can do uh, with Hammer is you can say, all right, uh, read this value and use that as the number of times to apply another parser. So if you have, so if you architect your parser so that you have essentially a general parser for R, a parser for all possible types of RRs, um, you can read the number of RRs, apply that parser that number of times, and you're fine but that's not how most people tend to do it. Context sensitivity and length fields. So remember, if you have a shotgun parser, Mr. Length Field is no longer your friend. 
This is the layout of an RR. And uh, what is to notice is that the first four fields are fixed uh, length and fixed interpretation. The fifth field, RD length, is the length of the R data that follows. The length, the content of R data that follows, is in fact the domain name for this record, and this domain name may contain big references. We actually have an example of DNS. Um, it's not complete, but it does, it does go at least this far. Um, in, uh, on the GitHub uh, repository for Hammer, uh, it's in the examples directory, and so you'll see that you know for the RD length R data field, um, the parser basically says, okay, RD length is the number of octets to read. Grab that many R data octets, and then apply the uh, apply the RR parser to that buffer. Now, think of validating this kind of a record. What do you need? You need the context of all of the previous packets. The domain name is compressed. It can only be checked after it's been expanded. This expansion must be consistent with your buffer. Your processing code is something that will create that buffer, will have the contract, will expect the validity. <coughs> this is what the code looks like. Uh, there is a switch uh, up above on the type, uh, on the integer type of uh, the case. And this DM expand will expand the, uh, the name into a canonical uh, form, uh, retrieving all the previously saved uh, uh, strings. And so you go checking that name. And uh, you need to eventually hand it off to your processor. And here is an MCPY. Guess what happens? You don't know the length of the string that you're going to end up with. You could, if you were doing a correct recognizer, completely compute that length first. Make sure that the length in the previous packet matches and only then commit to copying memory. Instead, look at the str length in there. You are copying this data. You are building up your substrings uh, for a further extension based on what comes in the input not having validated the packet, a MCPY corrupts memory. I mean, literally, you're just jumping, you're, you're creating a new buffer, essentially right at the end of the other one, and just copying straight into it. So, I mean, it should be obvious that one can clobber the other. This is, uh, and the reason this happens is that the data structure, the data format that you've committed yourself to, has subtle restrictions, subtle validity um, conditions on its lengths, on its length fields that occur throughout the data. It must be computed as you uh, parse the packet. And if you haven't recognized the packet fully, well, don't copy things into memory. You know, one thing we've noticed um, is that when th this, this particular pattern of, hey, let's uh, put two things right next to each other in memory because that'll make the, you know, that'll make the reads faster. G good intention, but leads you to having, you know, one buffer end up clobbering the other for some reason or another. We'll see, we, we've seen this here and we're about to see it again in, um, uh, in the IPv6 example. So having failed to, context, uh, to properly validate the context sensitive link, uh, gives you too much of a stir length, gives you the control. Beware of context sensitive data formats. Elements that must add up with their length fields across a long span are a temptation. They're danger. They're a sin. You can't go parsing the packet and uh, working on the data until you totally confirmed that they all end up. This is the type of that struct. This is the meaning of that struct. You should recognize it fully before you commit. <laughs>
And this is the story of the open SSH pre-op, uh, which broke the world in 2002 by way of goals. You, can, uh, you should study that next week. This is the simplest parser you can imagine. Here is um, a really well-formed piece of code. Packet get int. It eats four bytes off of the buffer that is the incoming packet and moves a pointer into that buffer. It's very, very simple. Look, uh, first you eat up an integer, then you eat up so many strings. And each string starts with a length. Uh, it, these are Pascal strings. This is a, how the packet get string works. Consumes four bytes and consumes so many bytes following it. And notice something. For this packet to be valid, you must have the number of uh, strings, number of challenge uh, uh, response, ch challenge uh, authentication responses, that number and rest should be exactly equal to the sum of all the characters that are uh, in uh, the strings. So you are looking at the stream and here is an integer that should add up with these integers, right? This is what makes it valid, nothing else does. Packet chip end of message actually kills parsing if the legs do not match. So at this point you might be wondering what's going wrong here. This sounds like exactly what they've been advocating all this time. But take a little deeper and you'll see that uh, there is a problem. The problem is that you are doing the memory allocation before you validate this condition. As it happened, this is susceptible to an integer overflow. And the way it was fixed, uh, random um, uh, restrictions were placed on and rest. But uh, the integer supplied in the packet was too large for the rest of the packet, was not rejected because you only reject when you check the end of message that you've consumed all the characters, there is no uh, uh, extra garbage, there is no uh, truncation. But by that time, you already copied memory. And that's, the, that's really the subtle parsing error there. They check the condition of what happens when we finish parsing and there is still data left. Well, that's obviously invalid. What they're not checking is what happens if we run out of packet before we're done parsing. And so uh, the X malloc length was too short. That gave uh, a memory corruption. Um, Gobbles uh, did uh, an amazing job uh, leveraging that memory corruption. But basically, once that memory corruption is there, you are sort of screwed. Uh, now, uh, actually, um, how, how do we have time? Uh, we're going to look through. Uh, I'm. Uh, we're going to walk one actual Emacs buffer, um, and then maybe we'll uh, look at uh, this code some more. The boundary between syntax and semantics is kind of tough. When you see special cases in the code that uh, have an integer, such as an offset, represent something different based on context, based on why it's passed in, that really means that your input format as a language has this special interesting feature which you are probably not handling right. Uh, the uh, proper intuition for this is code smells. So Martin Fowler wrote a, you know, the, he, he wrote the book literally on refactoring. Um, and in that book, and in a lot of work that has followed on in software engineering you know, as a discipline, uh, there has been developed a taxonomy of code smells, which is to say, things that, you know, if you see this in your code, you should say, huh, 
Is there something a little more interesting going on here? Because they don't necessarily signify that there's something horrible here. Um, you know, the, the C2 wiki, which we're about to refer to heavily, uh, makes the point that you know, there are purists and there are pragmatists when it comes to code smells. And a purist will say that every code smell needs to be eradicated from your code. The pragmatist will say, no, no, a code smell is a signal that there may be something funky going on here, and code smell should be investigated, but if it turns out that nothing's really going badly, then you don't have to, you don't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to do anything yeah. about that. Now, we'll make the case that the OpenBSD team thought that their code smell was okay because of what they were intending to do, but they missed a subtler point. Um, so you'll be able to decide for yourselves when we're done whether the purist or the pragmatist approach is better here. So this is, the year is 2007, and this is the IPv6 remote kernel stack buffer overflow. This is big. This is of death. This is the biggest one of them all. And this is actually uh, arbitrary code execution as well, as of course Ortega and Hera were able to show. And this is IPv6, right? This is a pretty complex uh, protocol that gets rid of some of the complexity of IPv4, but adds this linked fields and chaining of motions. So IPv6 is very much a language theoretic phenomenon. You uh, add only those headers that you need, and the place of those headers is, and the meaning of those headers is determined by the next header field. So uh, if you remember IPv4, uh, there used to be some uh, fragmentation crud in there, which uh, eventually just uh, converged to, hey, fragmentation on my network. Somebody is doing reconnaissance, or somebody is doing IDS evasion. Why don't you shut this down now? Uh, in IPv6, fragmentation was removed. It's now uh, not the uh, router's uh, responsibility. Uh, a host may fragment its own packets, but the, browser, uh, but, but the uh, uh, router wouldn't do it for you. And if the host needs to add some fragmentation, well, so it would. It will include a header, an optional header, that will carry the fragment ID and length information, and the next header will point to it. And so are the headers chain. Uh, you see the next header here is the upper layer header for, say, UDP or TCP payload. Here, there are some hop by hop headers, um, extension headers that may be uh, fragmentation headers, and only then an upper layer header. And they're all dispatched on this uh, uh, integer field, which is just the type of the header that follows. Now, this was the packet format. Let's look at the data structure format in which these packets are kept. Uh, one key to one claim uh, success of OpenBSD was the uh, performance of its MBUFs. MBUFs are 256 chunks of memory where packets are kept. Each pack a packet that is longer than 256 bytes of memory can be kept uh, across a chain of MBUFs. So the first uh, scheme you see here has the uh, obligatory header for each chunk, the M header. And the flags in the M header would tell you, is that the first packet, the first fragment of a packet? If yes, then it will be followed by the packet header, the second data structure here. Or is it uh, a data store? So if the flags, instead of um, uh, indicating that this is a packet header, say that this is a data, and it points to this cluster of MBUFs, uh, then you can see a packet with 256 first bytes in the data, and then the rest of it in the MBUF cluster, and uh, it's a union, so the extension uh, header, the little extension header, MX, uh, points at uh, uh, the storage. Interestingly, it also points at a free function. It contains a function pointer that will free that storage. Now, you're thinking, 
If you manage to overwrite a function pointer that sits right next to the data of the path, what can you do? And the answer is yes. This is how that uh, vulnerability was actually exploited. It took a whole lot of work untangling that um, uh, function pointer from uh, the rest of the kernel code and then uh, being predictable and then uh, exploiting it. But the uh, potential for overwrite is there. Those of you who are object-oriented uh, nerds are probably already a bit squicked by the fact that the mnext pointer in the header of one mbuff is pointing directly at the M header of the subsequent mbuff. I mean, that's like a serious violation of boundaries um, in proper uh, design. And you know, this is seen, people do that. And this was done for efficiency reasons. So you see there are two languages fighting each other. One, the language of IPv6 packets, complex one, with optional elements and variable links. The other, the language of mbuffs. So what happens is, packets are stored in chains of those mbuffs, and before they are recognized, before you, for example, assert that the ICMP packets, fragmented ICMP packets, are uh, in fact uh, valid, you already copy them into those buffers, and you operate on those buffers, uh, changing them in place. And I will show you the function that does that. This is, so what's going on here is basically it's like, you know, recognize an option, process it, recognize an option, process it, recognize an option, process it, and it's this interleaving that's causing this problem. Uh, this is extremely complex sensitive. And look, when you operate on the packet, you want the bytes to be in a row, not spread across the two M buffs. So you have this little function called M pull down, and this function ensures that uh, this stretch of bytes of the packet payload offset uh, to offset plus length is continuous. It will allocate another mbuff if uh, it's not contiguous and allocate it there. And so if an mbuff gets allocated right next to the previous mbuff, which is still being written into, and the thing that gets written into that first mbuff is too large, where does all that other data go? Directly into the next mbuff, of course and, you know, over the bridge and into the uh, river, that is to say the function pointer. This was a special case of the function that performed the buffer overflow. Look at this comment up there. In fact, this function, dot one, is called when the bytes are contiguous, but the author of the code wants to say something uh, by the fact that the offset is not at the beginning of the buffer. So this function, uh, m pull down, was being used to communicate another bit of information that turned out to be related to how fragmentation was handled, fragment headers were handled. You see a special case. You see a um, uh, strange language phenomenon that is being communicated about. Uh, and uh, this is where the uh, buffer overflow actually happened. Now, uh, let's look at uh, the structure. Okay, so the function that OpenBSD uses in the kernel to handle an IPv6 packet. Sergey is going to show you just exactly how big this sodding thing is. I mean, this is a nearly 500 line function. I mean, that's nuts. That's ridiculous. So this is, uh, this is the, uh, this is the uh, very simple interrupt handler that grabs the packet. Uh, the packet is already split into those M buffs and it's being dispatched to IP6 input. So here is IP6 input. Now, uh, this M, uh, M flags and X, uh, this is already your M buffs, M is your M buff, and you start parsing your packet. So is this packet uh, of the correct length? You're recognizing the packet. Is this packet of the correct length? Does it have a buffer? Um, 
Does it have the right uh, version uh, IP6? Blah, blah, blah. We've got about 10 minutes left, so let's get back to the slides rather than walking through this entire giant function. Yes. Uh, uh, just uh, one, one more second. So, you see, this is the recognizer. This is the recognizer. This is the recognizer. How much memory allocation do you think it already does? In the process of this recognizer, you see this IP is ICMP6 error. Uh, that's when the error is being sent back. This is the EO packet being rejected because of some uh, condition that's uh, wrong. And it just goes on and on. And throughout this, it is operating on those chains of MBUFs uh, using the data supplied by the packet. This is the hope by hope um, uh, uh, rewriting, and it just goes on and on and on. And uh, in the end, it's uh, finally deciding to uh, reject the buffer. And uh, what does this end with? This ends with uh, this, wonderful, this wonderful comment. More sanity checks in the header chain processing needed. <coughs> you bet they are. Right, so this is a code smell. If you print out the function and it is longer than you are tall, you are probably doing it wrong. So the pragmatic approach suggests that we want to look more closely into this and see what's going on. Well, that piece of code certainly has more than one responsibility because it's doing a whole bunch of recognition <laughs> stuff and it's doing a whole bunch of processing stuff. You know, so Bertrand Meyer was talking about object-oriented programming, so that's why he's talking about classes, but functions, you know, this, this is the case for functions and bound methods as well. If a function has more than one responsibility, that can lead to problems. Um, bloaty code is hard to read in the first place, um, but it's also very difficult to tell whether it's doing just what it should and nothing else. Now, I think what they were trying to do here was they were trying to honor the principle of composition, um, which says that you should keep everything at the same le level of abstraction. And right, you know, IPv6 is a layer, right? That's part of the it, it's it's part of that layer of the network stack. But as we've been saying, the syntax of the, a layer of the stack and the semantics of a layer of the stack are different sub-layers within the overall layer. So they're just not good, they're just at slightly too high of a level of abstraction in order for this method to really be the right thing. What they should do, or you know, should have done, is extracted the separate parts out into separate functions so that we can keep track of what's going on here. That's not what they actually ended up doing. What they ended up doing was uh, they took a function whose responsibility was being a recognizer and thoroughly crossbred it with uh, the processor, router, forwarder. Uh, they were very, very good. We're talking about the OpenBSD team. They just don't take anyone there. They probably wouldn't take me. But in a number of cases, they had language issues connected with length fields, fragmentation, and context sensitivity. And in one of those cases, just one, maybe, maybe, they didn't quite do it right. And the result was pillage. So when we say offsets, we could be talking about offsets into a packet, which is a syntactic issue or offsets into a buffer, which is a semantic issue. And when you have one packet equals one buffer, then you're fine. There's a one-to-one -one relationship between the two. But in the fragmentation case, or in the case of packets whose you know, data over is more than just one buffer, um, you don't have that guarantee. So here's what they did to fix it. And there's actually another code smell here. So as you see, um, they've inserted uh, a special case here. Now, when your code starts to handle lots and lots and lots of special cases, what this says is that you tried to generalize, but 
you had to add a bunch of exceptions to that generalization, so maybe your generalization wasn't quite as general as you thought it was, and maybe you need to look at how you're doing your generalization again. That's the arrow anti-pattern. You're adding a whole other level of nesting, um, and you know, again, this is, this is something worth looking into. So, you see, let me show you something. Um, I'm going to uh, show you the macro that actually reallocates the buffers and uh, pulls the M pool down, right? This is a macro that operates in the middle of the recognizer, allocating memory, uh, sewing up and creating new M buffs, okay? IP extender gets, okay? And now, let's see this. Let's see how frequently it occurs in the stack. Look, it occurs all through the stack. And look at this. Where does it occur the most? ICMP, ICMP6, which is in fact where the problem ended up being. Um, the attackers were able to generate a flow of fragmented packets and about one in a hundred packets drop root shell. And the uh, semantic ambiguity with the use of offset uh, as a language clue as to what the uh, packet, uh, what the buffer meant, uh, was the undoing of it. So isn't this interesting? This is how one of the most, because of this purely language theoretic issue, uh, one of the most resilient stacks was wrong. And might, uh, for all we know, uh, we're still investigating uh, just how serious the problem continues to be. Um, expect more soon. Uh, read the paper on the exploitation of this vulnerability. And you will see that the uh, geniuses uh, who exploited this at core actually couldn't be bothered to trace the path to the particular vulnerability uh, through the stack because it's just so complex. We think they probably found it by fuzzing. Um, you know, because of the extent to which um, fragmented packets can be, uh, uh, can, can be reduplicated uh, in that particular code path, ICMP6 was particularly vulnerable. Um, but we need to, you know, now that we've traced this back to what we're pretty sure is the root cause, we need to validate that and we may be having a conversation with Theo fairly soon. Yeah, uh, but uh, you see, this is really interesting in that uh, most of their work went into uh, composition of the exploit with the rest of the kernel and patching up what was broken, which was absolutely brilliant and is classic uh, hacker application of composition of kernel architecture. Uh, I always give that sort of thing as an example in any advanced OS class uh, uh, that comes my way. But um, it's interesting that this was probably not found by a top-down analysis. And it could have been, uh, and it, uh, you know, it could have been found from the stem, possibly, yeah. So, as we conclude, you know, I want to remind you all that these are just early dispatches from our survey of the taxonomy of exploitation. We're going to be spending an awful lot of time in the coming months with OSCDB re-examining existing vulnerabilities and looking at um, you know, other examples possibly in the same code bases that those original vulnerabilities came from. Um, because if it turns out that you know, these patterns are as pervasive as they've turned out to be in OpenBSD, um, we may be able to solve entire large swaths of bugs at one fell swoop. So we're pretty much out of time here, but we will, when is the workshop that we've got? We've got this is a good question. Okay, it's somewhere in the schedule. We'll sort this out at some point. But we will be yeah, we will be spending time, yeah, we'll be spending, you know, we've got a two-hour block tomorrow to work on exactly this sort of stuff. So if you're interested in hopping on the boat and helping us discover new species, new taxa of exploitation, please come join us tomorrow. We would absolutely love to have you. Do we have time for questions? And if so, what are they? Hopefully. And hopefully we have convinced you that uh, these particular kinds of uh, highly impactful exploits, uh, bugs, 
in highly professional reviews all go back to the violation of the basic language theoretical principles. Recognition should complete before you start processing. If your language is context sensitive, you should beware uh, such data formats, working on such data formats, before you validate them. Down. If you have a chain of links that should all agree, you should assert that first. Only then allocate memory where uh, your other important data lives. Otherwise, yeah, chances are it will get corrupted and overwritten because you are dealing with data that you have not validated. It may be too late to free up and discard that buffer uh, by the time you, you figure that something went wrong and there is some uh, mysterious uh, bike garbage uh, all over the place. Yeah, it will be a shame. But first and foremost, all of these examples come down to data languages. Data languages that which were a tad stronger or a tad more fast and loose handled than they had to be. And uh, when recognition fails, uh, the contract is violated, the processing will lend itself to uh, unauthorized computation, unanticipated computation, weird machine pillage. We have the code. You are welcome to join us and uh, pour over that code, or completely lambast us uh, for saying these things and say, "Hey, but you know, um, how can you parse without allocating memory?" And hopefully, we'll be able to satisfy you that, that there is a safe way to do that. We we'll point you to the hammer talk. Um, all right. Thank you. First, a couple of announcements. Um, after the lunch, there will also be workshops.